Halcyon, the Book of Pyman, is a fantasy horror podcast inspired by historical events and characters. This is a work of fiction and was created, developed, and produced by a multicultural team of various religious faiths and beliefs. Professor Pyman lives in a dangerous world. His story contains themes of violence, gore, and attempted sexual assault. Listener discretion is advised. Chapter 4, Mermaid Tears He walked through the promenade with one woman on each arm. What should have been scandalous in polite society, Clyde, he thought, looked natural for them. They chatted softly, sunlight glinting through the twins' powdered hair, already beautifully curled and braided for the next show. He still looked glamorous, with an otherworldly glow, even without their spangled costumes. And Pyman looked freshly pressed in a dark three-piece suit, fastidious as always, with her bowler hat and a walking stick. Though there was a lightness in him, in his step and movements and expression, that only seemed to occur in the presence of Feodora. Theodosia. He bore no signs of the party ordeal at all. He saw the twins into the mess tent through the dwindling crowd of performers and workmen, all of whom parted like the Red Sea in his wake. Others made way for the trio in the breakfast line, moving them to the front of the queue. The twins took only some bread and fruit passing up on the eggs and sausages on the giant iron skillets. And the professor took nothing at all. Gideon, do they... Do they really all sleep together? Gideon, who was on his third round of eggs and untold a number of sausage links, shrugged and turned a little pink and began staring intently at his plate. Clippy was picking at her own plate and still reeling from last night's events at the Edgerton's Gala. She watched as Pyman escorted the twins to a nearby table. I don't think the professor sleeps at all, to be honest. And all the time I've been with him, with the show I mean, I have never seen him in anything less than shirt sleeves and never, ever looking tired. Siobhan, the woman touted by the professor as having the world's longest hair, was softly humming to herself as she buttered her toast. Eh, don't be daft, Gideon. It's unhealthy if you don't sleep. Even if a body just closes their eyes for a wee while. Rest is good for the soul. Even for the professor and the twins. Hestia, the fire breather and snake charmer, threw her head back with a hearty laugh, as if she were about to loose a stream of flames from her throat. She winked at Calliope, who instantly felt herself flush, no less aware of Gideon's presence next to her at the moment. He sleeps, with them for certain, and probably much more. Hestia elbowed Della, who sat cross-legged next to her. The contortionist smiled back and cleared her throat, straightening her shoulders, and trying not to snicker at the blush that had crept into Calliope's cheeks. Chiffon shook her head with 
blatant disapproval. The wild coils of her mane ripple down her back with the motion. You shouldn't be talking about our professor in such a manner. Children, the lot of you. Dela, I expected better from you. Be an example to our young lady. We're lucky we Daniel is already up and playing with some of the other lads. This is not suitable conversation for weans. Well, I've never seen the professor sleeping. Some people don't need it. I read that somewhere once. Strange, but true. Must be nice, Della. Oh, Calliope. I wasn't talking about me. I need my beauty rest. Hestia does too. Or else she turns into a dragon lady. Della laughed at Hestia's good-natured scowl. And Calliope blinked her own burning eyes, raw from a night of restlessness and constant waking. She thought about telling Gideon about what she'd witnessed last evening, whenever she could get him alone. Of everyone here, she felt she could trust Gideon with the secret. How the professor seemingly killed a man outside the Edgerton's townhouse. How the world had darkened around him, changing the air until it was almost black and hard to breathe, until the lightning struck. She bit her lip instead. There had to be a reasonable explanation for the things she saw. Her gaze flicked over to the professor and the twins as he leaned on the table, watchful like a guard dog as if he could sense her watching. Pyman met her eyes and nodded, touching a finger to the bowler hat. Over the din and noise of people chatting and silverware clanging, Clypey felt her head start to swim. She gave a stiff nod in return and turned back to her plate deciding to give up on eating entirely, focusing instead on drowning in a mug of coffee, which was now cold and bitter. She'd forgotten to ask for sugar. She took a sip and pushed it away. From the corner of her eye, she watched the professor kiss each twin on the cheek, then make his way out of the tent off to do goodness knows what. Della broke the silence, pointing a finger at Gideon. Oh, it's your turn, by the way. Hestia and I have done it now for days, and Siobhan before that, and we've all been read the riot act for the last week. Bill has been in a mood. Gideon rolled his eyes and turned to Calliope. Well, fair is fair. Let's take some breakfast over to the folks in the Halcyon tent before there's nothing left. Do you mind giving me a hand? Guillermo and Sylvan couldn't be heirs to get up this morning, since they were well into their cups last night. And Vilha gets annoyed if her eggs are cold. I don't think I've met them yet. Oh. Calliope followed Gideon back to the mess line, all the while keeping an eye on Pyman's retreating figure. She certainly hadn't been long at the show, but she quickly noted how the professor seemed to be nowhere and everywhere all at once. Gideon stepped up to the line and made a vague gesture towards the thoroughfare. The first cook nodded and handed him a basket that had already been prepped and packed and a carafe of coffee, which was given to Calliope. He stopped the cook and muttered something about the we men. The cook took the basket back and added a few more sausages and biscuits, then handed it over to the strong man. Calliope flipped through the mental file of performers she had noted on the posters for the enigmatically named sideshow the professor had referred to as Halcyon. Pondering for a moment that 
everyone can be classified as we next to Gideon. Guillermo and Sylvan? Oh, they're clowns. Part of the pre-show. Professor brought them on a few years ago. Found them being horribly treated by another carnival. Now they're here, and they're well taken care of. Of course, they do love the drink a little bit too much. Gideon patted the very full basket and led Calliope around the tables. She was still getting used to the sights and sounds of circus life, including people in all manner of dress, or in some cases, undress, and in half makeup, sharing a breakfast with performing dogs or birds as easily as they would a close friend. And Vilha? The mermaid. Oh, mermaid. Of course. Calliope tried to imagine why a woman who was surely in a costume couldn't come over for her own morning meal. She had to walk fast to keep up with Gideon, having to take at least two steps to match his every stride as they navigated the well-worn path to the sideshow. So, what does a mermaid do? This made Gideon's upper lip twitch as he led the way. She smokes and swears. <laughs> she can't even drink the little folk under the table. I should think that's rather unbecoming of a mermaid. Hmm. Well, then you'll have to meet Vilha. Despite the time of day and bright morning sun, Sideshow Alley grew darker and darker as Calliope walked with Gideon, kept company also by her racing thoughts and heartbeat drumming away. Halcyon was painted in bright gold and black letters over the largest tent at the end of the row, and a dim light shone through the gaps of the canvas. A few flickering lanterns were littered around the circular floor, placed by the stages of each of Pyman's peculiar persons who were featured in the tent. Hoops and bars for the pretty Della, fire wands and baskets for Hestia, weights and dumbbells in Gideon Circle, a mirror for the kind chiffon with the long hair, and what in the... Calliope stopped short and almost ran into Gideon as the sound of a splash drew her attention to the other side of the room. A few steps closer and she caught the glint of a silver fin that swished against a metal tub. The red embers of a cigarette winked eerily in the gloom, hanging from a pair of pale lips. She'd seen the posters, but surely this is just a woman dressed up in a costume. One of Pyman's illusions? A puff of white smoke was the immediate answer to the question. Misty white eyes flicked up at Calliope. And this woman, this mermaid, shrugged, switching the cigarette to an opposite hand in order to accommodate the bottle of vodka that lay half empty by the tub. Good morning, beautiful. Breakfast is served. The pale woman huffed at Gideon's cheery tone, put the cigarette out in the water, and took the basket, holding it over the tub to avoid getting it wet. Her vessel was barely large enough for bathing, let alone a grown person. And with a splash, she flipped the cotton napkin back with a long white finger. What is it this morning? Just the usual. Coffee? Miss Vilha? And this is Calliope K. 
Calamus. Sydney's niece. Ah, so this is Silas and Anders' girl. Calliope stood awkwardly behind Gideon, holding the coffee pot like a safety blanket. Bill has squinted as Calliope continued in an attempt to unpack the deception of the mermaid's appearance. Everything from the luminous wet skin to the very fishy tail, but could not find a trace of makeup or a stitch of cloth other than the obvious bejeweled top the mermaid wore to cover her chest. Her hair was long and dark, inky against the shadows that fell in the cover of the tent. Very nice to meet you. Calliope recovered her manners and tried not to stare. Wide-eyed and gape-mouthed at this half-fish, half-woman who adjusted her position, sloshing water against the sides of the tub, and handed the basket back to Gideon. Her eyes were bright, but there seemed to be a film that covered them, and the mermaid stared back, looking at Calliope through the low light of the tent. If this was an illusion, it was certainly a masterful one. But Calliope's attention shifted, and in an instant, the words escaped her lips before she could stop herself. You knew my parents? Yes. Yes. Come closer so I can see you better. I think you look very much like your mother. But I see. Those cheekbones. The nose. Oh, there is dear Silas. The mermaid reached out a hand. Clammy and damp and cool though it was. And touched Calliope's cheek. Without warning, Calliope felt the tears well up and spill over, adding to the droplets on Villa's pale fingers. Even Uncle Sidney hasn't told me about them, and it's all I've really wanted since I stepped foot here. Gideon, looking stricken in the presence of a crying woman, instantly foraged in the basket to offer a napkin in lieu of a handkerchief. But Calliope never looked away from the mermaid. What were they like, my parents? Were they kind? Were they happy? I just want to know if I'm at all like them, even in the slightest. Yes. Yeah. Very kind, my child. Vilha removed her hand and leaned back in the water with a sigh. Calliope could smell the vodka on her breath, but it made no difference. She was enraptured, hanging on every word that fell from the mermaid's lips. Your mother... She would always know what to say when we were sad. And many of us were. So often. We'd miss our homes. Our families. And places that we left behind so long ago. And children. Children we never got to see. Villa gave a nod in Calliope's direction. I guess sweet Inda and I have that in common now, don't we? I'm... I'm so sorry. I didn't wish to bring up sadness for you. It's just that I know nothing of them. I remember my father so very little and that I would do anything to make him smile. 
sing and dance and make funny faces. He missed her, I know. She died when I was born. As it can happen. But they were happy together for the time they were here. Just know that. And they were happy. Happy for you. Until the end. Until they left. But why... Why did they go? Why didn't Father want to stay here with Sydney? Here with the show? Or come back after Mother? It may be best for you to ask the Professor. He will tell you. If he thinks you should know. Vilha reclined back into her tub, taking a bite of the now soggy eggs, which Calliope imagined must surely be cold by now. The mermaid's eyes once again found Calliope's face, still wet with tears, and she offered the girl a half smile. Your parents were my friends. Nearly like family. And I miss them. I do miss them. Every day. Vilha looked away for a moment, as if finding something on the wall particularly interesting. Gideon was still standing by with a basket and a neck and held monthly in an outstretched hand, which Calliope finally took. The moments of silence stretched wide. But it was then that Calliope heard small splashes, like pebbles being tossed into a lake. Villa turned her attention back to her guest, and once again stretched a hand out to Calliope. And her palm were indeed what looked like pebbles, tiny, and smooth, not unlike sea glass one might find at the beach. Bella pressed the three small stones into the hand that held the napkin. Among my people, we shed tears for those we love and make a gift of them to their families, so that those who loved them know we feel their loss too. These are for my friends, for Enda, for Silas, and for the love that passed between them, for you. The stones warmed against Calliope's skin, which was hot from emotion and her own tears. She was too tired to puzzle what these unusual stones really were. But she held tight to them, nonetheless. The emotion welled up in her, spilling over, thick like honey. But she managed to speak, <laughs> barely. Thank you. Come back and visit me. Another day, perhaps when my eggs aren't delivered cold. She winked at Gideon, who returned an amused grimace in Vilha's direction and adjusted the basket in his grasp. Calliope swallowed against the lump in her throat, backing away from the tub, as the mermaid once again picked up the vodka bottle and took a healthy tug. The mysterious woman bobbed her head in Calliope's direction before leaning back in the tub to close her eyes. I'll see you soon. You know where to find me. Daughter of Enda. Goodbye. And thank you. Vilha. Um... Come on, Miss Calliope. Let's 
Go find Sylvan and Guillermo. They'll be quite thrilled to make your acquaintance. They can be a bit excitable around the ladies, so... Take them with a grain of salt, okay? Gideon led her through one of the hidden flaps to the canvas tunnel behind the main stage, while Calliope dabbed at her eyes, then wrapped the stones in her handkerchief, which she folded into her skirt pocket. She didn't give the pebbles another thought after meeting the boisterous clowns, who, as Gideon said, were indeed very happy to meet the newest addition to the circus family. Pretty ladies just falling out of the sky for us! <laughs> Guillermo smiled up at Calliope and gave her a cheeky wink, blowing a kiss in Calliope's direction. His brother, not to be outdone, bowed low, just as the professor had when she first met him. Sylvan, the slightly taller of the duo, smirked. <laughs> You'll have to forgive Guillermo, my brother. He has no self-control. I, on the other hand, know how to treat a pretty lady. Sylvan took Calliope's hand and kissed it repeatedly alright that's enough you two would it kill you to try and make a good impression Guillermo laughed pouring another cup of coffee for himself as his brother attacked the remaining biscuits <laughs> it might be gulo <laughs> why bother Miss Calliope will learn the truth sooner or later. Calliope felt the tears drain away as she watched the small men devour the contents of the basket. Somehow their smeared makeup from last night added to their comedic effect and their antics to one-up each other. A little dance here, a joke or a juggled coffee cup there, a piece of taffy or chocolate to seemingly win Calliope's favor in her smile. As she noted in her journal, how can one be sad for long when a pair of clowns live right next door? Halcyon, the Book of Pyman podcast, and all its entities are a production of Pyman Media, LLC, all rights reserved. Halcyon, the Book of Pyman is written by Shannon Lynn and James Gray, directed and edited by Jared Huffaker. Music and sound effects provided by Epidemic Sound. All episodes are available wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. And Professor Pyman asks for you to please rate, review, and subscribe and visit halcyonpodcast.com for more information.